You look very cute. Will you take off your shirt? Show the other, your other shirt that you wear? <laughs> <laughs> so how many weeks pregnant are you? 13 weeks. The real heart of it all is on how you bring a child into the world. Every single mother I've ever interviewed out of hundreds of interviews who has given birth on her own, whether at home or in a birth center or in the hospital, says the same exact thing. If I can do that, I can do anything. I love you. I love you. Let me ask you this. If in 1975 our C-section rate was 7% in this country, why is it 29% now? The hospitals lose an awful lot of their babies. They lose a lot of their mothers. There's a high mortality rate. It doesn't seem like having a baby in the hospital is the safest thing to do. And as a, as a husband, it's my job to protect my wife. I think the worst thing that we're doing to women is not telling them the truth. The last person I want to trust the, the life of my wife and unborn baby with is, is frankly the medical system. The German word for hospital is sick house. You know, we don't need these normal births in a sick house. So uh, we're going to have our baby at home. Uh, we're not going to go see a doctor. Uh, Mandy has decided not to take any kind of drugs whatsoever. And we're not going to do any tests. There were people born a million years before they had doctors. It was never required. It was a natural procedure. I want my birth to be a magical moment. I want to create that experience for myself for my baby, for my husband, for us as a family. The other day when we have a baby and, uh, and we're holding him or her in our hands, um, we'll know that, uh, that we did the best that we could based on, on what we discovered throughout our journey. We are pregnant in America. What do you, uh, where do you hope to have your babies? You mean where city-wise or where like hospital versus house? Oh, that's a good question. Very good question. What do you, what do you mean? Kaiser Hospital? Uh, probably a hospital. Definitely a hospital. But there are some hospitals that specialize more in natural childbirth, and so that would be my preference. I don't think a hospital is necessary. I personally don't like hospitals. <laughs> I'm a big uh, believer in midwives and, and doulas and having children at home, but personally, I would go to a hospital. Right now, that's my feeling. Although I've known lots of people who've had very successful home births and water. And yeah, it's a choice. The fluorescent lights, the creepy nurse outfits, and like the sterile beds that it's just like antibacterial smell it's just kind of sickening now with all these hospital problems i think i would rather do it at home i've always wondered how it would be at home like in the comfort of your home where you, you know everything's at you know, health wise for the baby it seems like you know it's a no-brainer for the hospital and what made you decide on having a baby in the hospital <sighs> probably just the technology <laughs> uh the health care everything that obviously you plan for a hospital but there's other circumstances that sometimes don't allow it. I think that would be the safest thing to do. Like I said, I have no experience at it. No, I'm maybe a little bit scared because I don't know how to have a baby on my own, you know? Um, if I know how to do it, I would do it. More than 4 million women give birth each year in the United States. 98% of those women choose to have their baby in a hospital. Childbirth in America is so difficult right now. We have, in Western civilization, thought now, because of our programming and training, that, that birth is a very dangerous event. And therefore, you must go to the, to the hospital. Too often, pregnancy care is boilerplate. It's a protocol. And there's not enough room for 
individualization. McDonaldization, the application of fast food principles like time, efficiency, and control to other areas of American society. The modern hospital uh, is increasingly a business, and they're increasingly owned by huge conglomerates, which are applying these uh, business principles to their operation. Would you like fries with that? Today in our country, babies' birthdays are not being determined by nature. They're being determined by doctors' schedules and hospital schedules. It's basically the same kind of advantage that Henry Ford found over 100 years ago in the automobile assembly line. Childbirth is a money-making machine. It's a business. And hospitals, the majority of them in the United States, are owned by large corporate chains. Most people know this. The woman in the family is somebody that chooses and drives the health care decisions in the family. Hospitals now advertise abundantly on billboards about their maternity ward. You begin to build this long-term relationship with the family. Um, their kids see the pediatricians that are next door in the MLB. The, uh, the dad gets the knee replaced in the OR. It all, it just becomes their place, and we hook them in by providing women's services in the form of OB and GYN and some other things that can be done. I remember one woman saying to me, you have to have your baby in a hospital because like my friend they gave her this wrong medication and she almost died and if she hadn't been in a hospital she could have died if she hadn't been in the hospital they wouldn't have given her the wrong medication but it doesn't matter the hospital is the place where it's not your fault what large organizations are seeking to do is to mcdonaldize um, hospital operations as, as much as they possibly can well mandy and i decided to hit the streets of new york city to find out what the average person thought. Only when we got there, people seemed to be overly concerned about one thing. Childbirth? Pain. <laughs> Hurts. Pain. <laughs> Labor, the process of giving birth. Nasty. Lots of pain. I just yeah. had one. You did? How was it? Woo. Painful. I don't know, I hear it hurts. Labor. Physical or mental effort, work, especially when difficult. I don't think it has to be horrible, but I think it's not pleasant. Karen! <laughs> They've even talked about possibly adopting rather than actually doing that, you know, having their own, so. Manny and I heard that things were a little different in Uganda. And she came and squatted over him, and very quickly, here came a baby. He said, I either caught it or let it fall into the bottom of that hole, which they used for birth all the time. They then got him out of the hole, and everybody was congratulating him, and they were so excited that this baby had been delivered by an American baby catcher. And they were passing the baby all around for everybody to nuzzle and kiss and hug and so on. And the delighted, beaming mother there, she put that baby in a sling next to her breast, and she went back over, and she picked up that blankety-blank hoe and started working in her garden again. <laughs> he said, my world fell apart. I, how would I ever go back to the world of medicine as I knew it? <clears throat> when now I knew what a simple and joyful and quick, apparently painless thing this was. So what are your feelings on it? Are you, are you nervous at all? Are you... No, I, like, I know with certainty that I can have a pain-free childbirth without drugs. And I've even heard that women have orgasm during childbirth. Oh, I didn't have one with my kids. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I never heard of that. Well, I don't have three at home. When the woman is giving birth well and making some of the sounds that spontaneously come out of some women, it sounds an awful lot like uh, good sex. Oh, dear. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> My name is Mandy Bonagoria. I'm going to have an orgasm during birth. <laughs> I don't think I believe that one. <laughs> yeah. I heard about it, but I don't know if it's true because it never happened to me. <laughs> uh, now, if you can really do that, uh... Hey, more power to you. I wish, uh, wish I could give birth and, and have an orgasm at the same time. Well, actually, you do feel a little tingly. I'm not gonna lie, you do feel a little tingly. 
once that baby head come out, you feel a little tingle. You get kind of warm, you be like, oh shit. I've never experienced that one. <laughs> when the baby's coming out, actually when it's coming out, it feels, that's the best time during the pregnancy to me. It feels very warm when it's coming out. Very warm and nice. You can hit different angles with inside the uterus. You could feel your vagina is open up, naturally open up, and you just felt a warm feet just sliding out. I think it's impossible. It's impossible? Yeah. Because it's labor and it's painful. It felt good, no pain, and I'm not lying. When you're pregnant, you go through a lot of emotions and a lot of things going on with your body, so anything's possible. Good luck. Okay, maybe an orgasm is a little extreme, but does it seem to you like today, men and women are more focused on the pains of giving birth rather than a joy or empowerment? The epidural has become so pervasive in hospital birth. The conversation among women is usually, how soon are you gonna get your epidural? Epidural, an injection of drugs into the epidural space of the spine to create a loss of sensation in a woman's lower body. Doctors don't ask the question, how can I make this easier for the mother without drugs? They never ask that question. They ask the question, why would any woman want to go through this experience without drugs? They kept asking me if I wanted an epidural, but I didn't. Some of us have found that the process itself, um, the actual process of birth, is quite an extraordinary event and would choose not to just miss that. I just wanted to try and go natural as long as I could um, before taking any medicine or anything, you know, that I didn't absolutely need. Being able to be a strong woman but also have a feminine soft side is very difficult to do today. And to really accept and to um, have integrity and pride in being a woman today means so many different things not to miss it by being completely numbed through it, not to miss it by being surgically removed from it. And I kept saying, no, no, I can do it, I can do it. If you have something the size of a small watermelon coming down through your body, it, it is going to push things out of the way. Oh, that's going to just shred you up. Are you positive you don't want this? And I'm like, why? You know, should I be getting it or something? Any part of your body that you would try to stretch and pull, even if you put your fingers in your mouth and stretch them right now, it stinks. I ended up having my son without any pain medication. They don't see the, the psychological benefits. They don't see the benefits three months down the road. There is not cultural valuation anymore on women's bravery and courage in pushing their babies out on their own, except in the natural childbirth and home birth movement. Doula. A woman experienced in childbirth who supports a mother physically and emotionally before, during, and after birth. So many women go into a hospital and say, I want to have a natural birth, and they tell the charge nurse, don't come near me with drugs. Please don't ask me if I want drugs. And you know, the woman gets into this place of vulnerability in her birthing, and the nurse comes in and says, oh, honey, you can really make it through this if you just have a little bit of painkiller, you know, a little bit of epidural, whatever it is they want to offer. And you know, when a woman's vulnerable, she might say, oh, okay. And so as a doula, I would come in and say, remember you wanted to do this naturally. Are you sure you still want to do this this way? You know, just to kind of get their, help them get their voice back. For me, uh, facing my fears is a part of me becoming more of the woman that I want to be. What if we told you she's going to have her baby without any drugs? Without any drugs, no painkiller or nothing? That's awesome. Natural birth is good, man. Easy for him to say. Epidural. Absolutely. No pain. You just want drugs? I want drugs. Thing, I actually had natural cover. I don't recommend it for everyone. If you can get your hooks, take it. It's much easier. I can't imagine having a child with no drugs. <laughs> it really, 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 really hurts. Did you have the epidural? No, I didn't. Hmm? You did it natural? Yeah, natural birth. Why is that? Why is that? Because I'm a strong lady. I know another strong lady, my mother. 30 years ago, she made the commitment to give birth to me without an epidural or any other type of drug. Thanks, Mom. It really means a lot to me that my mother made that choice. Today, up to 80% of women are making a different choice. 
Why aren't more women making the decision to just say no? Women now have a right to pain medication. That's the way it's presented in um, obstetrics. And women are buying into it. My sister just had a baby, and she had um, 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 epidural? Um, epidural. She didn't really want it, but at the last, her pain was so bad, she said, I'll take it. She hated it, because the whole time she was yelling, uh, I feel lost, I have no control. A mother and a baby are designed to work together during labor. And when drugs are used, they both are drug impaired, so they're not working together. And that's not all to consider. Apparently, there are a few risks associated with having an epidural. Um, more than a few. So chemicals go straight through the placenta and affect the baby. The drugs that are used in the epidural cross the placental barrier, go into the baby's body. The experiences of the fetus and the newborn baby, whatever experiences it has, ultimately select the genetic expression that can lead to cancer. There's studies that link birth drugs with teenage uh, drug addiction behavioral problems, cardiovascular disease, attention problems, obesity, nightmares, teenage suicide. And it was seeded when we were kids only to manifest itself when we were adults. Sounds scary. Although studies often claim all sorts of things. But let me ask you a question. What if birth drugs do have negative consequences? Is it really worth the risk? Making a documentary uh, on my wife's birth experience and um, you said you're an anesthesiologist. What, like, my wife doesn't want to have an epidural okay. um, because of health reasons for the baby. Okay. Um, and some things that we've read online okay. is, 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 I know sometimes maybe it's necessary, but are there consequences? Is there any danger to the baby having, not having an epidural? No, to having an epidural. To having inside. an epidural? Um, not. Not really. Not any really. More than anything else. I mean, anything you do, there can be a danger to the baby. Anything. But there can also be a danger to not having an epidural. Like, I've spoken to a lot of natural birth people also, and like, a lot of them say, like, the most empowering experience I ever had was delivering a baby without any drugs. Yeah. Some women feel that way. Um, some say they'd never do it again. <laughs> I mean, I know that a lot of my uh, my wife did it once without without an epidural, and uh, it's empowering. I don't know, because some women really, it really means something to them to do it without, do it naturally. So, cool. Sounds cool. like your wife might be one of those. She definitely is. Okay. She definitely is. She <laughs> wants a natural birth. She, we're even thinking of having an at-home birth. Ah, oh, now that's dangerous. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Why? Why? Well, when you do this, when you see as many deliveries as I see, you see a number of them that supposedly were low risk and then something bad happens. And if something bad happens, you don't have time to get to the hospital. We have, for 50 years, been brainwashing American women about childbirth, about how dangerous it is, how all the terrible things that can go wrong, and how you need to be in the hospital where all the doctors are and all the machines are and all the operating tables so that we can take care of those horrendous emergencies when they occur. And it's not true? It's absolutely not true. There have been lots of studies that actually look at whether home birth is safe or not. And what they find is that home birth actually can be safe. And in some ways, and I hate to say this because it'll make my obstetrician colleagues cringe, in some cases, home birth is safer than hospital birth if you look at the likelihood of cesarean section. Home birth can be safer than hospital birth? This is worth looking into. So we hopped on a plane and went to Holland, the home birth capital of the world, where lots of women are choosing to have their babies at home. We met Dr. Tom Kroonin, who actually lives in this windmill right here. 
Dr. Krunin shared his thoughts with us about how pregnant women should be treated. But we don't see it as a medical thing. It's a natural thing, and sometimes you need medical assistance. So that in America, it's not, uh, it's not uh, usual that you deliver at home? No. Because there's less bacteria at home than in the hospital. A lot of people think uh, it's a sterile environment in the hospital, but it's, it's the contrary. There's a lot of bacteria in hospitals, a lot of very ill people. I didn't see any hospital during the, the labor. 87% of the women we see in our practice delivers at home. It's quite a bit, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Anytime we mention it to friends or family, they say, at home? They still do that? Yes, it's yeah. natural. But you have, but you have a doctor, stopped. right? Because we have healthy women, we have healthy pregnancies, we don't see much complications. I'm 41. You're 41? Yes. So I'm a very late mother, but uh, everything went well. She delivered at home? Yeah, at home. I lived at home. No complications. I liked it. <laughs> we go visit them also every day after the delivery. We always do a round to check all the women and children. It's always been like this, and it's all covered. And especially the home delivery is, is very cheap. You don't need an expensive hospital, you don't need an expensive gynecologist, you don't need, you, you only need a cheap midwife. Holland was amazing, and it was incredible to see the different viewpoints they had about birth. They had completely different beliefs, completely different attitudes, and completely different practices on how to bring a child into the world. What do you think of life in Holland, honey? <laughs> I think I could live here. <laughs> we were also invited to sit in on Dr. Kroonin's office hours and get a chance to meet lots of Dutch couples and women and hear some of their ideas and attitudes about birth. Uh, Hello. Mandy Hello. and Steve. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's very comfortable to be at home and to just uh, be, yeah, have your own things around and be in your own bed. And we select, we, we do risk selection. If there's a problem, there's a serious problem, they go to the hospital. So the ones we keep here, they are healthy women with healthy pregnancies. We don't see it as uh, when you go with your car to the garage and uh, you fix something. Um, because usually nothing is broken or nothing is damaged. We, we don't say patients, we say clients, because they're, they're not ill. You coach them through pregnancy and delivery, and, and you have to do that really well, because they won't forget you for, for their lifetime. I read some, uh, somewhere that in America there's so much pain medication during the labor, and that's not usual uh, in Holland. And they know it hurts, but it's only for a short period of time. And, uh, well, my mother did it, and my grandmother did it, so I can do it. So, and of course, there are millions of other women uh, in the world who did it. I think that it's uh, not necessary uh, either, um, because the woman's body is built to, to do something like this. The feeling that you have uh, afterwards is uh, much better, that you can be prouder of yourself that you did it all on your own. We traveled to Germany because we had heard that hospitals in Germany catered much more to the needs of women than hospitals in the United States. For example, in German hospitals, there are more options for women to give birth. Some women like to be in a wide room that need space and, and, and air and light. And then there are other women who want it nice and cozy. If you let a woman move the way she, she feels like it, she will find a position for herself that hurts her less and where she feels the baby moving really. There's no good reason for a woman to lay like this because the pelvic bone here in front is a um, is hindering the baby's head, of course. The baby has to make a, a movement around it. So in the end, there's a curve that the baby has to do. And it is delivered upwards. So the woman has to put double force. She has to push the baby out and she has to push it up. As soon as she turns, the whole second uh, problem isn't there anymore. And in countries outside the U.S., it is more common for women to have more personalized one-on-one -on -one attention when giving birth. Midwife, a person trained in natural methods to help women give birth at home, in a birth center, or in a hospital. 
part of my job to empower women that they can trust themselves or that they learn how to trust themselves. Somehow you have to go through the birth on your own. I mean, you're the only one who act who's actually able to, to give birth. The other ones can do a vacuum or a forceps or a, an epidural or a cesarean section. But you, you, you as a woman, you have to, to give birth on your own. Mandy found these words to be inspiring and was curious about the benefits of using a midwife. An American woman who gave birth in Germany shared with us her experience. You know, Christina came to visit me as well in the hospital and, was, and it was uh, just very nice. You know, she said, oh, you know, it's kind of normal to have a midwife and insurance pays for it and everything. So it's like, okay, well, let's see. And then after the first or second visit, I was really like, oh, wow, this is um, great. Because she's checking not only the baby, but she's checking me as well to make sure oh, it's okay, everything looks okay, you're healing. And that was very reassuring. That's so reassuring to me. It made me feel more confident. You know, there was, you know you're so emotional. After the days afterwards, I think I burst into tears I don't know how many times. Hi. Hi, Max. But it was just support, you know. But that, I think, was the biggest difference, was after the fact, I had Christina coming to me, you know, every day for nearly three weeks. Midwives are treasured in the societies they lived in. Childbirthing's always been a woman's position with other women and, and, a, and a community to support themselves. They knew things uh, about birth, life, death, human body, emotion, mind-body connection, uh, the healing properties of plants, of certain foods, and so on. And this is precious to um, many societies' survival. Martha Ballard is an American pioneer colonial midwife who practiced in New England, who left a diary. In her case, 95% of the births she attended came out just fine without a doctor, without any medication, without any um, antiseptic, you know, just common sense and helping women through the pain of labor, helping them be in physiologic positions for birth. That's basically all that most births need. Uh, medicine came on far later and took a lot of its knowledge from midwives and wrote it down. And the written word is a lot of what changed things and gave medicine its power. Actually, there was a real fight between midwives and doctors. Almost all societies had midwives, you know, and, and they, their names are even interesting. Midwife, what does it mean? With woman in English. We now have bought a belief that midwives are tinkerers that are, you know, could interfere with everything and make it all, you know, like who would have a baby with a midwife when you could have it in this bright, shiny hospital? In Icelandic, you have hlos mother. That means light mother. Within the generation, the medical wor world move in and and pass laws that make it made it even illegal to have a child at home. In French, you have sashvam, wise woman. If you had your child at home and something should go wrong, you could be in prison for the rest of your life for it. In Swedish, you have Jordmor, Earth Mother. And you had a, a real campaign that was pretty horrifying when you look at the pictures now, of very racist Irish midwives with whiskey in their bags, Jewish midwives with great big cook noses, and really racist, ugly, ugly campaign to drive the midwives out of business. And midwifery, the helping women uh, were stomped out, literally. Partera, that means she who parts, you know, the mother and the child. Well, Ida Mae Gaskin, who I know you interviewed, she's a wealth of knowledge that should be explored by conventional medicine. Let's look at the numbers. At her midwifery center in Tennessee, Ida Mae's midwives have helped over 2,000 women give birth. 95% of the women in their care needed absolutely no medical intervention and never went to the hospital. Out of the more than 2,000 women, less than 30 of them had a C-section. That equals a C-section rate of less than 1.5% versus the national average of 30%. It's exciting that these women get to experience such great results. But what about the other 4 million women who give birth each year in the United States? Hopefully things will change. I think that there's a tremendous movement in this country to, to reshape and reform birth. I deserve and want the, the best for me. I agreed with Mandy, so we hired our own midwife. 
So I've had my own practice for 10 years, and I've seen a lot of um, wonderful, wonderful, what I call butter births, smooth as butter. And then I also have had some complications. Um, when there are complications where either the mom or the baby deviates from normal, we, I have no problem asking for help. And because I'm licensed, I can get support in the hospital right away. And I'm not afraid to either call 911 or get in the car and go. Mm -hmm. Because um, the most important thing is that mom and baby are safe and healthy. And in the event that we have to go, I stay with them until everybody is safe. Never lost a baby, never lost a mom. Mandy wanted to let her father know she was planning on having a home birth to see what he thought about our decision. The horse breeder and former racehorse jockey reminded us about the wisdom of Mother Nature. Most animals instinctively, I guess, want to go off and be by themselves, you know? And they try to pick a safe place where no predators can get to them. And I've had them take them down here in the back and have them, and you can walk all around down there and you can't find them, but you know they're there. And sooner or later, you'll you'll just stumble up on them because they've got them hid so well. You just don't do a whole lot of things to a horse, you know? They pretty much have one natural. You don't have to induce labor. I mean, you get worried about them if they go over, but they'll end up having them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people sit up all night long with them. I've tried to do that, and they never have it. And the first night I don't, I walk out the next morning, and I got a baby. So how would you feel about Mandy using that same kind of concept? One of the people we saw in Europe told her, she asked for advice, and he said, no, nope, just lock yourself up in the bathroom and uh, don't come out until you have the baby. You don't need anybody's help or anything. What would you say about that? <laughs> well, I would like to have her leave herself an option, you know, but uh, you can't never tell when you might decide to change your mind or would uh, just want somebody there. As long as there's no serious problems, I don't know but one person that can have a baby, and that's the mother. Mother Nature knows best. To make birth as beautiful and sacred as it can be, and safe, of course, very safe, we need privacy. We need, yes, we need to feel safe, but we can give birth with somebody offering you massage, music, movement, telling you how to breathe. You know, it's very depowering and we don't need it. The basic need when women give birth, and when mammals give birth, is privacy, not to feel observed. When a woman is in labor and you disturb it because you start to give advice, support, loving hands here and there, talking to her, look, trying to look into her eyes, when you disturb the process, the contractions start to slow down, slow down, slow down. It comes a time where most women are completely lost. Did you throw up? No. I started having feelings of it. You know, it's so true. Um, about the privacy thing because as soon as I heard you turn off the car I had a feeling you were getting the camera and my body just stopped and it wouldn't like relieve itself or move into the next period well known that to give birth, a woman, like all mammals, is supposed to release a complex flow of hormones, a cocktail of hormones, the main one being oxytocin. Oxytocin, the love hormone needed to initiate and facilitate a woman's labor. The minutes, the seconds after giving birth is when the woman gets the highest oxytocin rush she will ever have in her life. Oxytocin is the main one because it's necessary to contract the uterus. The more you're relaxed and happy, the more your oxytocin levels are high, the easier it is, the less pain. 
There is immediately after the birth of the baby a short period of time which will never happen again and which is critical in the mother-baby attachment. That's called the birth high. It's so that you go into ecstasy right after you give birth to receive your newborn baby, to fall in love with your newborn baby. Your whole body responds to the presence of this baby on your body. The milk starts to come. The baby responds with its own pheromones and its own flood of hormones and begins to suckle. A successful bonding and breastfeeding are established and so is a lifelong beneficial relationship. In our society, many women are not in the right environment to reach the right hormonal balance. They cannot release their oxytocin. They cannot uh, release also their endorphins. Once we introduce fear into the birthing process, then oxytocin is inhibited and adrenaline uh, dominates. That's why most women at the present time in our society needs pharmacological substitutes, drugs, to replace the hormones they cannot release by themselves. And of course, what they need first is a drip of synthetic oxytocin. The most common trademark in the USA is pitocin. It's synthetic oxytocin. Induction. The use of synthetic hormones, i.e. drugs, to artificially initiate and facilitate labor. The pharmacological induction of labor is one of the most serious, drastic, and dangerous interventions that you can make and should only be done if there's an important medical risk here. It's a good idea if you want to control your staffing requirements. It's a good idea if you want to talk about liability. And the feedback that you get from the multitudes of small, medium, and large programs. There's just a move for more inductions. It's a great idea if you own a drug company. Between 1990 and the year 2000, the induction rate doubled from 10% to 20%. During the same 10 years, the number of babies born, Monday through Friday, shot way up. Doctors, by this time in American obstetrical history, are so used to using Pitocin for induction or augmentation that they literally don't know how to attend vaginal births without it. Why are we not looking further than the end of the intravenous uh, tube that these women are, are subjecting themselves to? It's the C word, convenience. There are medical reasons, like if the placenta is coming off the wall of the uterus. Absolutely. Medical problems with the mom or the baby? Yes, obviously. Doctors use the intervention, and then they have to save the babies because they've used the intervention. Every time that they would give me Pitocin, my daughter's heart rate would drop. So after about 13 hours, they're starting to get worried about her. And so well, they did an emergency C-section. 50% of women who have inductions end up with a cesarean section. They said they were worried about her, that her heart rate kept dropping. But we were, I was induced, so if we had waited until she was ready to come, it might have been a different story. Many, many, many more women will end up with a C-section than a vaginal birth by having an induction. One thing happens after another, and it's like this domino that falls down. And if they don't have the scheduled induction, then they they eliminate the one in two chance they're going to have a cesarean section. When they told me they could induce me, I was like, sign me up. So. How far away from the actual induction date were you? It was the, her day, or due date. Yeah. We don't use the word due date. We use guest date or guest month because um, people get all caught up in the date on the calendar. As soon as they find out they're pregnant, they circle that date, like their baby's going to come on that date or by that date, and if it doesn't, something's wrong. We don't know the long-term effects of Pitocin, of the artificial hormone that's used most often to induce labors. There isn't a woman in this country, in my opinion, who would ever, ever, ever put her baby at risk for convenience. No. That's why I call it a human experiment. Obstetrician, a physician trained as a surgeon who specializes in delivering babies. 
obstetricians, stroke, gynecologists. You are trained in both. And it means that you do obstetrics and you do gynecology. Gynecology is a surgical specialty. It is that branch of surgery that has to do with the female organs. Cesarean section, a surgical incision of the abdomen and uterus performed during labor to save the mother or baby during an emergency. My doctor's office, I had heard already had a reputation. They like to do cesareans because it's easier for them. You hear these things. The C-section rate in the US in 1975 was a low 7%. The World Health Organization warns not to exceed 15%. Today in the US, our C-section rate is an alarming 30%. Third of all women need a C-section? How could that be? What has changed? What hospitals and doctors have learned is that it's more efficient um, to do a cesarean uh, than it is to uh, let the natural process take its course. I didn't want a C-section, and I made it really clear to my doctors I didn't want a C-section. They just told me it was my choice, and but the chance, like, there's risks involved in that they just prefer doing C-sections. It is kind of a no-brainer to say, how come the U.S. has such a high cesarean section rate? Well, it has a high surgical rate because the people you ask to take care of it are surgeons. They could have tried and had that natural childbirth experience, but they seem to push for the cesarean. The mechanics of doing it, you know, slice here or slice there, you lift the baby out, sew them up, and there you are, is much more efficient than the vagaries of a, a natural childbirth where you might have the baby coming out at different kind of angles and creating uh, different kinds of problems. They told me I was going to have a C-section. But as a doctor, I have just saved a woman from a dangerous and pathological, chaotic, unknown experience. I've given her a controlled birth in a controlled environment, and I have delivered or produced from her body a healthy baby. What's the problem? To a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Well, to a surgeon, <laughs> every problem looks like a surgical problem. This last Friday, they had 15 births and 10 of them were C-sections. And it was because Cinco de Mayo was that weekend. What? When you get up to Thursday and Friday, they almost double. And then on the weekend, there's hardly any at all. Because the cesarean is under the doctor's control. I make the cut as the physician. I pull the baby out. I sew up the cut. I know exactly what I'm doing. There is no doubt involved, at least in my mind. And I'm out of there and back at my private office seeing my clients. Um, my baby was born 9 pounds, 5 ounces, and 20 inches long. Well, you might think that was easy. And in a technical sense, it was easy. But what did you do? It was kind of a mixed emotions, because I really enjoyed having the baby there, and he was healthy and strong. But at the same time, I missed all the first few moments of his life. They put a big sheet, and you can't, you can't see. You can't hear. From the mother's point of view, if she didn't want the cesarean, she's just been robbed of the chance to have the kind of empowering birth that she wanted. She may have been robbed of her chance to bond with the baby, and she may have been robbed of the chance to successfully breastfeed. Um, and so it was really hard, and but it was all worth it. Like the recovery time of six weeks is all worth it. Having a healthy baby boy that, and he's just great. Six weeks. Six weeks to recover. <laughs> As cesareans is very difficult to recover from. C-section recovery is far worse than a regular recovery. There are many risks of cesarean that are not really discussed. And I think that this is unfortunate and we may say even is ethically uh, inappropriate. go back to where only 7% of all women need a C-section. Because we aren't saving any more babies with all this technology. And you can prove that by America being 28th on the list of infant mortality right now in the world. Cesarean section saves lives. 
it also increases the risk that the woman will die and it increases the risk that the baby will die. It is major abdominal surgery. Major abdominal surgery that one out of three women in our country are having. It just doesn't seem safe, does it? In my wedding vows to Mandy, I promise to always protect her. That's one of the main reasons for making this film. Ironically, sometimes that strong desire to protect can actually interfere and cause the opposite to happen. I'm feeling unprepared for the arrival of our child. And as I'm becoming more and more aware that we're actually going to have a life to take care of and I've been having dreams of actually holding our baby and it's becoming more and more real that what's inside of me is going to be outside of me and we're going to have to continue to take care of it throughout the day like I'm starting to feel more behind because of our traveling and We still don't have a, a plan on when we're going to be home, and it's just hard to, to have everything in our life be so uncertain. I mean, I'm flexible, but I'm starting to stretch the limits of my flexibility when thinking about bringing a new life into our family. Planning for a baby is hard enough. Imagine if your insurance company told you that they wouldn't cover your medical expenses if you tried to have a vaginal birth after cesarean. This couple had to do something a little extreme. In the state of Washington, the, the idea that you would have a normal birth, a vaginal birth, after a C-section is like, is unheard of. You know, there's really only one doctor around here who is who, who's even going to consider a VBAC. So, so, so nobody just, will do it because so everyone's just afraid. we kind of looked at each other and went, oh my gosh. I'm practically being forced to go under the knife. We're, we're kind of held hostage here. Because I had a C-section beforehand. Yeah. There's two hospitals that we know of in the state of Washington that actually do, do, VBACs. do VBACs. I was so much more excited about it because I thought, OK, I know what to expect this time. I really think I can do it this time. What is a medical group that basically they, from what we've, we've heard, they say they do VBACs, but they almost never do them. So we went to meet with this doctor. They let you try. They, they do selective. You... It's very selective yeah. who they let try. Yeah. She was basically like, well, yeah, we do the VBAC, but you know, it's not usually very successful, and I'll go ahead and give it a try. We actually talked to them, and they wouldn't take us. The insurance company will not cover anything. Okay, this yeah. is a very complicated issue. If I have a natural birth, mm -hmm. and everything is perfect in my natural birth, it could cost around $15,000. We actually went to this particular doctor and tried the VBAC. So if for some reason I really do have to have a C-section or if something goes wrong, which, you know, not that it's going to, but you want to know, it could actually end up being forty dollars to $45,000. Out of pocket. And oh, by the way, because I'm not insured, my, the hospital wants a $20,000 deposit before they'll admit me. As much as humanly possible, at every step of the way, we're going to remind you how dangerous what you're doing really is. And I could actually have a C-section. I could do an elective C-section. It would probably only cost around twenty thousand dollars. So we're but thinking you're starting to make that different choice. Like, well, maybe we should just have a C-section. If we bargain shop, can we get a good price? The whole possibility of having a natural birth is just like slowly being thrown away. I called the a hospital in Canada and found out that their C-section, the cost, the hospital cost, remember twenty thousand dollars here. The hospital cost for a C-section in Canada is two thousand dollars. It's ridiculous. And then three thousand dollars a day, a day for the hospital. For the so hospital stay. most expensive, maybe eight thousand dollars. Part of me still hates to believe that our, we've come to that place in humanity where everything really is all about the almighty dollar. It's insane. It's ridiculous. And so as a result, you know, we are we are uh, pregnant in America and going to Canada to, to have, have our, our baby. baby. <laughs> and, we'll come back. Yeah. Um, we'll come back. Another weekend where we say goodbye to the United States to go have our doctor experience. It's all about the almighty dollar. Bye. You can't have mine. See you later. Okay, we're lucky, you know. We we are resourceful people. We're empowered. We can make choices. And we know how to do that. But there are people that don't, you know. I mean, there are there are women right now in the state who are basically getting cut open because 
everybody around them is telling them that's their only option and that their baby's going to be hurt or and they're being made to feel like that's the only I mean I understand because I felt that way I mean I literally shocked to find out well how much is this elective c-section and I was thinking of dates I was figuring out well maybe this day would work or that day would work because that's what everyone kept telling me I had to do so the only affordable answer to having their baby normally was to pack their bags cross the border and give birth in Canada Disturbed by what's happening to pregnant women in America, I contacted ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Their mission statement includes serving as a strong advocate for quality health care for women and maintaining the highest standards of clinical practice. I called to ask what they were doing to help reduce the C-section rate in America to the percentage that the World Health Organization recommends not exceeding. They said they don't speak to filmmakers. So I went to the annual convention that ACOG puts on every year to get more answers. I figured I should be able to find some obstetricians who are willing to speak to me to share the doctor's side of the story and find out what can be done between patients and doctors to change the system, lower the number of C-sections, and make things safer for mothers and babies. Apparently, I wasn't the only one who had an issue to discuss with ACOG. But I came here to talk to doctors However, there seems to be more pharmaceutical reps than anyone else, and I couldn't help but to wonder why. Eventually, we did find an obstetrician who would speak to us. He works out of a hospital in Miami, which has a 56% C-section rate. His rate, however, is only 7%, and he is totally disheartened with the system he works in. I think trends have changed, you know, globally, actually, and certainly nationwide. Uh, there's more cesarean sections occurring and uh, less, I think, less patients taking more of an active role in terms of what they want for their birth experience. Uh, a lot of patients now are more comfortable having epidural anesthesia. Uh, a lot of them don't seem to be reacting to issues of cesarean sections. They pretty much they go along with it and they think and a lot of people are actually requesting cesarean sections, which I find kind of unusual, requesting surgery when it doesn't need to be done. So here's your choice as a doctor. 20 minute C section, 20 to 30 minute cesarean section, or staying with somebody up in labor for 16 or 18 hours and possibly getting sued because of a bad outcome. If I pick up a scalpel and cut open a woman's belly and do a cesarean because I'm afraid of going to court or I'm afraid that my malpractice premiums are going to be too high, I'm not practicing medicine. I'm practicing fear and greed. So from a common sense approach, I think doctors are favoring the first, which is, I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. Right. But it's sort of, you understand where the dynamics going by here. When the doctor is in control, he's the one that's reading the electronic fetal monitor. Well, I think a lot of doctors say, hey, if I got a reason to do a cesarean section, I can leave in 20 minutes and get back to my office and not lose a whole night's sleep. He's the one that is talking to the nurses. I've heard stories from nurses that certain doctors don't want them checking the patients. And the reasons why they say they don't want them checking the patients because they don't want them to document that the patients made progress. So for example, if someone's like two centimeters and a nurse isn't allowed to check the patient and then the doctor comes in hours later and checks and oh, she's two centimeters. Well, you know, who's, who's to say? You know what I'm saying? He's the only one to check yeah. her. So, and, and I actually heard this from the nurses. They're saying, yeah, there's doctors that do this. But if the nurse went and checked, said so now she's four to five, well, then he's not got a good reason to do a C-section. Okay. I've seen a doctor who would like to go home, come up to um, a husband and say, do you really want to see your wife continue this? And I would have preferred to have waited and uh, felt it out, but they pushed for the C-section, so we went with it. We could have your baby out in 20 minutes. At the end of it, you have a, you have a baby boy who's healthy, and, and you're happy that he's healthy, and who knows how it would have went the other way, and I think that's a why a lot of people don't raise the flag. So, I mean, I hear this and I, I kind of like scratch my head saying, how, how is it possible we've come to this? How is it possible we've come to this? A maternity care system where doctors are being influenced by their schedules or fear of litigation and women's medical decisions are being made in the boardrooms of hospitals and insurance companies? Breach birth, the delivery of an infant with feet or buttocks appearing first. Vaginal breach births are not really being taught much anymore. The obstetricians don't know as much mm. now as they did 20, 25, 30 years ago when I began. Hospital, everybody thinks this is like the biggest emergency, like cardiac arrest. 
They don't have breach skills anymore. Blue lights are flashing, the cart's coming. They're not allowed to know. And who stopped them from knowing that is the insurance companies. Oh my God, breach baby! <gasps> breach babies are gonna be delivered by cesarean section. The insurance companies uh, began around the early 80s to tell hospitals that they would have their insurance policies canceled if their doctors who were expert at breech birth continued to teach the incoming students how to do it. You know, a woman at home can have a breech child. Well, how does she do it? People in all parts of the world have always known how to get breech babies out. She deals with her intuitive nature self, and biology is intelligent. Uh, she can help deliver her own baby, even if it's a breech baby. This has been forgotten by the obstetricians in the United States, and it's leading it to be forgotten all over the world. And that's unfortunate, but that's just the state of the way things are. I want an awesome pregnancy, delivery, childbirth experience, wonderful, amazing life with my child and with my husband and my family. No one's beliefs habits, attitudes are going to get in the way of me getting exactly that. Oh, we're glad to have you guys here as part of the baby fair. So if you come down this afternoon, you might even become part of this documentary because you want to know about the birthing experience. Also, uh, we have a website, pregnantinamerica.com, which is an amazing resource for women. We've been compiling all these expert interviews and putting it onto our website. So if you're pregnant, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, if you love someone who's thinking about getting pregnant, check out our website. There's so many amazing resources for you and your family. The outcomes in hospitals for women are less than ideal. Women are disappointed and they come out feeling robbed. This is not something that is kind of a myth or uh, just something that you're making up or I'm making up. It is real. You are one of many. You are a statistic. I wish it could be better. Even though I love medicine, I think that women need to be more in charge of their own birth. Your option is hospital or hospital. Unfortunately, we are um, victims of our insurance. So wherever Aetna says I can deliver, that's pretty much what I'm doing. And I would rather have a water birth, but they don't have that option at the hospital. You are trying to control a very sometimes out of control um, event. I don't want to, you know, be confined to the bed. If I want to walk around, I want to walk around. And they put some medicine in my IV, and I didn't have any idea what was going on. And I'm like, what happened? A lot of us wish that we, we might not have gone in this direction. And they tie your hands on the table because you shiver so bad that your hands will just fall and just flop. There's others in the, in the field that feel like attempting to control um, the birth and the delivery of a, of a infant is, is the way to go. Didn't tell me about it or anything, just put the vacuum on her and sucked her out. A lot of the nurses, I think, don't realize that you're working with people. I feel that the system is broken. I just kind of went along with it. And we're not even happy with the care we're getting. If we have a second child, I'm going to definitely um, do things differently. There's definitely an emotional impact on the family when you when you begin to drive that process um, for the sake of time, efficiencies, and control. We asked Becky about her experience. A part of us didn't want to believe her story. My doctor was in the OR, so she, the, the nurse had said that to wait, and she would come out and she would give me the epidural as soon as she was finished. And so I waited like an hour just kicking and screaming because I was in so much pain. They called the doctor, and since the doctor was in OR and they put her on hold, then the nurse slammed the phone down and she said, we don't have time to wait for this doctor to get over here. So we're going to go ahead and deliver the baby ourselves. Some random doctor came in, delivered the baby without any pain meds, and then um, after the baby was delivered, the doctor sewed me up without giving me any local anesthetic. So I felt the stitches, and it was really painful. And then the doctor left the room and left me and my baby without, uh, like, help. You know, like, the nurse was there, and she took care of my son, and I was bleeding everywhere. And then I got up to go to the bathroom to clean myself up, and the one doctor just left the needle with the uh, medicine in it just sitting on the, on the shelf. And then 
my sister's like, well, what's this shot here for? What's this needle with this medicine in it? And the nurse goes, oh, look, the doctor's just leaving that needle thing around. She didn't even um, give her her anesthetic. Because I was induced, because I was overdue, I wouldn't be induced again. I would let my baby come natural. But the whole experience was just really horrible. It's pretty scary to think that someone else could take power away from me. While making this film, many stories we heard touched our lives. Like the Connecticut father who will have to raise his child on his own because his wife died from the infected needle wound from her epidural. And the California woman scarred for life by the flames the laser used for her C-section ignited on her body. And the Florida mom who will never get to hold or hug her baby after her arms and legs were amputated due to a bacteria she caught while in the hospital. But nothing affected us as much as one tragic story about a controversial drug, Cytotec. This drug is not approved by the FDA for this purpose. It says on it not to be used on pregnant women. Yet it is being used all over this country to induce labor at the end of the pregnancy. As a result, we have hundreds of dead babies, many, many, many dead women, because this drug has very serious risks associated with it. For example, one of the risks is uterine rupture. The, the uterus, the womb, blows like a balloon has been blown too hard. It explodes. And when this happens, there's a very big chance the baby will die and a significant chance that the woman will die. This is a humongous obstetric emergency. I'd like you to meet Tasha Oden French. In December 2001, at the age of 32, Tasha was in perfect health and was getting ready to have her first baby. There were no problems with her pregnancy until her doctors administered the drug Cytotec, generic name misoprostol, to induce her labor. According to her family, Tasha was never warned about the risks of using Cytotec for this unapproved use. Manufactured as an anti-ulcer drug, Cytotec was never intended to be used on pregnant women. Approximately 10 hours after being administered the drug Cytotec, Tasha suffered hyperstimulation of her uterus, one of the many risks that the manufacturer of the drug warned against. An amniotic fluid embolism was released and an emergency C-section was performed because the baby was also in distress. Both Tasha and her baby Zora died in the operating room. Do you think that if Tasha had seen the label from the manufacturer of the drug or the letter from the drug company warning healthcare providers about its dangers, she would have allowed the use of Cytotec to induce her labor? Pressure from the family and the foundation in Tasha's name inspired the FDA to get involved and post an alert on their website. And despite the alert from the FDA and the manufacturer's warning, Cytotec is still being used on women every day. Hospitals love Cytotec because it's cheap. Well, Mark Bauer, a lawyer out of New York City, is committed to making sure it's not so cheap. He was able to get a settlement in a case involving Cytotec. Why would a hospital settle for $27 million if they believed there was nothing wrong with the drug? And you don't hear about it because most of these cases are settled out of court before it ever gets to trial. And it includes a gag order, which means that nobody involved in the case can say anything about what went on. Today, I accompanied Tasha's mother to another meeting with the FDA to get them to take a more proactive action to get doctors to stop administering the dangerous drug for its unapproved use on women in labor. Today, we're here to um, find out from the FDA what the status is of the medicine guide, which is something that we've asked them to create. Uh, we submitted a petition to them um, after the death of my daughter and my granddaughter when they were given Cytotec. Why is it cheap? It's cheap because the pharmaceutical company never had to spend the money to do an experimental trial on pregnant women. And we started the petition about two years ago. Uh, we now have close to 3,000 signatures, 
and a lot of comments from a lot of women who've been given Cytotec and to induce their labor who have had catastrophic events. The hospital saves a ton of money, but the women pay the price. Am I angry? Yeah, I'm angry, but I know from um, past experience that anger has to be channeled into productive modes um, because anger itself isn't necessarily productive. Do not use Cytotec for induction of labor. Changing that whole perspective on childbirth is not going to be accomplished by burning a building down. Asked her before if she's angry. Ask her that now. They wouldn't even take the signatures. All the other times they've taken the signatures. They that, wouldn't look, they, they wouldn't take would not, They're right be, here. Obviously, the FDA doesn't have any control um, and apparently no influence over the medical community in terms of saying, okay, well, we don't approve this, you know, for being used to induce labor. And in fact, it causes fetal death and maternal death. And the, the, um, the majority of ACOG doctors just, you know, go along their way inducing labor with it. They've never heard in the paper that, you know, all these cases have caused death and, and uterine um, ruptures and um, damaged babies. And I mean, the least they could do is that. And they waffled on that. And, well, we'll put it out to all these different divisions and we'll see if we can do that. But I got to tell you, I don't hold a lot of hope. You know, um, yeah. He said, you know, my brother lost his wife and his baby and he'll never get over it. And none of us will get over it. And they said it on more than one occasion. They don't want to interfere with the practice of medicine. That's not what they do. And if we need to take it to another level, that's, that's where we'll go because the whole institution. It's just very sad that in a country that has the amount of technology and, and knowledge and education that the United States does, has such institutionalized, such has has institutionalized medicine, you know, and um, all these facades of protecting the people and and you know providing the best product possible, and it's all a sham. So, so we'll keep doing what we got to do, and and. Um, you know, I just know that you can do what you gotta do. So hopefully, you know, the combination can change things. <laughs> so thank you. The busy obstetrician has too much to do. And of all the things on their plate, the worst thing of all is normal birth. Because it takes 12 hours, it happens in the old time, it's a nightmare. That's the thing I want to bring under control. And if I use induction and I use cesarean, I bring it under control. Were doctors really trying to intentionally control women's birth experiences? I'd like to think that wasn't the case. But when I got a phone call from my sister-in-law in Kansas, whose doctor told her three weeks before she was even due that she was going to have to have a cesarean, I began to have my doubts. So they were saying that the baby's head is too big your pelvic area is too small. But they weren't giving me the numbers on my pelvic area. They, didn't, they wouldn't give you numbers. She had no clue what those numbers were. She said she was going to call me back. I never heard from her. I said, well, isn't the baby's head meant to conform to that hole and, you know, the plates molding? I said, isn't that the correct term? And she says, well, who told you that? And I said, well, actually, in our Lamas class that we did, what, what Lamas class you go to? I said, the one in your office. <laughs> he was pushing the C-section so hard. And, and you hear him repeat it over and over. We're just concerned about your baby. We just want your baby to be OK. Don't you want your baby to be OK? Well, who in the right mind is going to say, no, I don't, I don't want my baby to be OK. Give me half-ass care. Nobody's going to say that, OK? You know? So 
then there's it's like there's you're backed into a corner. There's no way to argue with what they're telling you because they're like, well, if you want your baby to be healthier, if you want to be safe, then you need to do what we say. So Luke and Gina decided to fire their doctor and find a new one. And it's a good thing they did because the next day Gina went into labor despite the fact that her doctor said she was too small and needed a C-section. It took a lot of courage for Luke and Gina to fire that doctor and find the one that had faith in Gina's body and her ability to birth her baby vaginally. Uh, pushing really hard for 16. I was going to feel like well, not there. The and then when it gets through, <laughs> probably just jump right out of there like a fish going upstream. So I'm, uh, can't wait. Well, we did wait for over 30 hours while Gina worked hard to prove her doctor wrong and bring her child into the world the way she wanted to. We knew that the hospital was slightly annoyed with the fact that Mandy and I were there, in their faces the whole time, advocating for Gina. But once they found out that we were making a documentary, I don't think they wanted us there anymore. Uh, you either show us or we'll have to take the tape and look at it. The things that go on in this hospital are here. It's a HIPAA violation. Yes. It's a federal violation. Um, videotaping the life of my family. Well, I need to see it. My brother-in-law and his wife just gave birth. I don't care I don't about know. your brother-in-law. I want to, I want the tape. I did care about my brother-in-law. I was there for him and Gina. So I went back to capture the first moments of my nephew's life until security actually came into Gina's hospital room and interrupted our family moment. The hospital administration said, we are to escort you off property and tell you not to return. That's fine. If we need to, I can have the police come out and issue a criminal trespass warrant. Well, that wouldn't happen, but that's fine. I'm not trespassing. The next day, I went to see Gina's original doctor to tell him the good news that Gina didn't need a C-section. His secretary told me he was on vacation. I wonder if that had anything to do with the C-section he had Gina scheduled for the day before he left. So I decided to file a complaint at the management office of Gina's doctor but that didn't go so well. You got a problem? Um, yes, I do. I'd love to chat. Um, Are about. you a patient? And since I wasn't a patient, she wouldn't speak to me at all. But that wasn't good enough. So I called her back a few days later. I'm the director of operations for Preferred Medical Associates. And there are several offices that fall under our domain. Uh, but we don't set those kinds of clinical standards for physicians. They're set by their boarded certification group. And so I, I don't really know what you want from me. I mean, we're just the people that put practices together and make sure that they're operating efficiently and we do the billing and that kind of stuff. But as far as getting into the clinical uh, efficacy of what you're talking about, you're talking to the wrong person. Who is the right person to be talking to? Why weren't health professionals addressing my concerns? I went to the hospital Gina's ex-doctor delivered babies at to find out their position. So is this going? Can you shut that off, please? You know, to me, I've been doing this for a long time, and the C-section rate is quite the lowest it's ever been. Uh -huh. um, so just at this particular birth center, again? not just here, just nationwide. How could a nurse who works in a maternity ward be so wrong about a well-documented medical trend? They sent one of their big wigs down for backup. With my sister-in-law, the doctor found that she was too small which to me is like that's bogus. How's a woman that's too small? How can a woman be too small? <laughs> Going to college? Yes. Yeah. How can a, a woman be too small? We're, we're talking physical attributes. Not everybody's built the same. I can't believe a hospital administrator was actually laughing at an expecting father. And what the hell is a security guard doing asking me if I'd been to college? I know, but doesn't How the do baby's you know head have, doesn't the, the, the bones in the baby's you're head right. you know, you're basically as collapse and come out? Should be, you know, you feel better talking with the doctor. 
Doctors in America do not want any significant change in the present system. They have all the power, they have all the control, and they're making big bucks. We were glad to be taking a different route. A home birth with no insurance companies, hospital quotas to meet, or unnecessary interventions. Just a loving midwife who does what she does because she wants to help other women experience the miracle of birth. I think it's important to, like, what you're doing, feeling your feelings, and really just stay in them as long as you need to be, because if you stuff them, they're going to come up again until you get it. Mm -hmm. And um, trust that, to try to be open to the willingness to trust that you have everything you need, and that inside, instinctually, you know exactly what to do. Being real is, is so important because during labor, it all comes out. If it doesn't come out now, <laughs> it comes out there. Yeah, and so just being aware of where you're at. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything I can do, I know it's hard to ask for help, but I'm right here. Okay. And you can call anytime. And so can you, Steve. Thanks. Not only were we grateful for how kind, loving, and present Amy was with us, we also trusted the history and the knowledge that midwives have passed on from generation to generation. We felt safe at home with Amy, and we believed we were doing the right thing. I think it's important that we understand it's not one side that's right and one side that's wrong. If a natural birthing process starts and there is a problem, then you bring in the doctor. There's no problem doing that. I just don't think it's it, it, that you bring in the doctor first and then go through the process that way. I think that the doctors are standby. For someone who's motivated about taking or about having their baby at home, it really might be the right thing for them. They have to understand the risks. Things can go wrong. And uh, when things go wrong, you need to have a hospital and doctor. And thank goodness for C-sections. Thank goodness for technology. Once in a while, there is a reason to have an epidural to lower a woman's blood pressure if it's too high. Or to use Pitocin to get a, a labor started that's been stalled because the woman's tired and so is her uterus. Thank goodness for all of this stuff. But in countries where they don't use it just as a normal management of labor technique or protocol, they have much better statistics, much better outcomes, and we can learn from that. We should learn from it. Delivering at home, but within 15 minutes of a hospital. As soon as I think about childbirth and I really think about my body, having created with my partner having created a real life inside of me that's going to come out into this world. And I want it to be beautiful. I want it to have integrity. I want it to have life and vision and creativity and abundance and light. And I think the only way that I can do that is in our own, not to try to sound too fluffy, but our own sacred space, our own loving nest, and that's our home. It's like waiting to play a championship game and not knowing when you're going to play the game. Today's due date doesn't mean anything. It's just an approximate two-week period before or after <laughs> the so baby comes. about the fact that today's the due date or anything like that? No, I'm excited. I really think I've gone insane because, because I've been keeping a high level of focus and taking care of Mandy and 
for this entire time. Every time I think about it, I just it just makes me excited and makes me visualize the birth more and more and more. And um, I, I just have more of a picture of what birth could look like and feel like. I don't even know if it's a boy or a girl yet. It feels very good to know how close we are to to having a baby. Tell me more about her about Manny's dilation right now. precious moment you can together as a couple. Be a family. You go from being a couple to a family. That's what you've always wanted your whole life. Having some contractions. Ooh. Walking to try to stay loose and open. <laughs> really pointy. Excited at all? I'm kind of not wanting to get excited yet because I don't know if it's happening. So I don't want to be excited about something that might not be happening. I'm tired. So I'd like to get ready for bed and then kind of see what happens. This is totally amazing. Manny's outside and she's totally into herself and I, I'm not sure whether I want to take, I want to take the camera out there and film her because it's so amazing, but I don't want to stick the camera in her face or even let her know uh, that I'm recording and, and bother her state and, and take her out of the place she's in right now. Amy, hey, it's Steve and Mandy. Um, it is 4.08 and Mandy is um, in labor, um, her birthing experience has begun. I will try paging you. Um, yeah, give us a call on this cell phone. I'll have it with me. Oh. Answer the phone. Our midwife Amy is here. She got here at about 6.10. It's now 6.20. Mandy's still in labor. It's picked up a lot lately. Um, she is, uh, she's, <laughs> she's a good sport. She's having fun. Uh, it's intense. This is an intense experience for her. Ah. Ow. Ah. Mom? Hi. Um, everything's okay, but I think we want you to come down here. Manny's just in a lot of pain, and and I just think your presence and love can really help. She's talking about going to the hospital, getting an epidural. She's like, give me an epidural. So... I know. I know. No, that's, she's not, no, I'm feeling that is. Crazy, oh, let's see, 12 hours now. 
Um, Mandy is doing much better. Uh, Amy's been able to calm down Mandy's breathing, and so she's she's nice and calm now. She's still experiencing a lot of discomfort, but she's no longer screaming for an epidural, which is good news. Hopefully, uh, it won't be much longer, and uh, she'll start being able to push soon. So eventually Mandy, you know, bear down, and she just looked like this birth warrior. That's how I would, she was a birth warrior. And then like, boom, this, this head appears. And within like, it took like a second or two, and then I realized that this head was, I couldn't tell, either my son or my daughter. And that's when like all these, I don't know what was going on inside of me, but I just started to fall in love with, with my baby. You know, the cord is wrapped around her neck, so our midwife just pulled the cord over her neck and um, then Mandy pushed the baby the rest of the way out and I caught her and uh, I pulled her up to, to Mandy's chest and laid the baby on the chest. the most amazing feeling I've ever had in my life. And I never felt so much in love with my wife, with my family, and it was a miracle. There's no doubt in my mind after experiencing it, this is, you know, as close to magic as human beings can know. When you're able to do it yourself, the sense of transcendence is absolutely indescribable. It is the most powerful experience I've ever had in my life when I pushed my 10-pound baby out on my own at home. As an anthropologist, I can't really tell you that. As a woman who gave birth, I can say there is no more empowering experience that a woman can possibly have than giving birth herself. I watched this woman uh, go through her labor, and then when she got near the end, I watched her when she suddenly got her power. You know, all the hormones began to flow and all of this went on and she started saying, get back, I'm gonna have this baby now. And she had that baby. And for the first time in my life, after years in the field, I saw a woman in her full power and it scared me to death. Giving birth on your own means that the flow of oxytocin and prolactin from you to the baby is not interrupted. Your whole body responds to the presence of this baby on your body. The milk starts to come. The baby responds with its own pheromones and its own flood of hormones and begins to suckle. A successful bonding and breastfeeding are established and so is a lifelong beneficial relationship. And I have to stop because it makes me cry to say that. Oh. <laughs> Because people just don't get it, and it's so sad. <laughs> That's so sad. I, you know, I've been saying this stuff for 20 years, and I, I usually don't cry when I say it because I've gotten so inured to that it's just the way it is. But every now and then, I really feel it. It's like it's so sad what women are missing, and they don't know that they're missing it. A few hours later, I saw worry in Amy's face. Bella wasn't latching on. She was lethargic, and her respiratory rate was really high. Amy sat me down and suggested that we go to the hospital. After much inner struggle, I decided it was the right choice. When the ambulance came, 
They wouldn't let Mandy or I ride in the back with Bella. Mandy was stuck in the front, and I had to follow in my car. All I could do to keep from falling apart was to trust that everything would be okay and imagine us all together as a family, walking hand in hand. But a part of me still wondered if we'd be taking our daughter home with us. Instead of focusing on what we don't want, maybe we should start focusing on what we do. Never lost a baby, never lost a food. Hospitals lose an awful lot of their babies. Look around, it can be done better. Doctors are important. I don't want to say throw away doctors. They're living at home, but within 15 minutes of a hospital. The last person I want to trust the, the life of my wife and baby with is, is for medical system. Never lost a baby, never lost a mom. I think something inside of us says we want the drama of a problem. And I did not want the drama of losing my baby. I did not want the drama of having Mandy lose her firstborn. I didn't want other people's sympathy because, you know, our baby didn't make it. We were no longer at home in a hot tub with lit candles. We were no longer in the privacy of our own home. We were in a room with pale walls and bright lights in my baby's face. What's happening? I want you to tell me what's happening. I want you to tell me, uh, you know, what your evidence is for thinking that this might be the situation. I want to know what the alternatives are. I want to know what our options are. I want to know what percentages are. Her getting poked with needles and then getting poked again because they missed the vein, and then her getting poked again because they missed the vein again, and being moved in ways that a mother would never move her child. Isabella, to see her eyes looking around, like looking for where's my mommy, where's my mommy, where's my mom? And for her only to find the faces of people who were just doing their job, as loving as these people might be, they were in love with our baby. Of course, in the last 
two days. I've had about six hours of sleep, so I'm pretty wiped. Um, but it feels really good to have her in my arms. It took a lot of work to manage the hospital staff because they weren't perfect, far from perfect. It's been over 24 hours that we've been here with her. And this is just the third time I've been able to hold her. So it's um, really nice and very special to get to connect with her here and draping myself over her little plastic cubicle. You know, I had to deal with a lot of the nurses wanting to hold the baby more than me. I'm the father. Well, you're, you're the nurse. Why do you need to hold the baby? Give the baby to me. The baby wants to be with me and, my, and the mother and the mother first, and then with me, and then with other family, and then with friends, and then maybe with a nurse. Um, so it wasn't easy. It's just what happened to you, you know? It's your individual circumstances. It's your lived experience. You got to, you almost like, I'm not gonna go that you create your own reality thing too much here, but it's almost like you created a chance to observe both systems from the inside. You know, you I, got the home birth and you got the hospital experience big time. I know, uh -uh. I know. And it gave me, it, it gave me a lot of perspective and gave me a real understanding of what's happening inside the hospitals. So the midwife kind of erred on the side of caution, is that? Yeah. How do you feel about that now? Um, <laughs> Are you mad at her for doing that? She did what she thought was best. In the end, it, it was my decision to, to go or not go. And I asked the question, what do I want to live with for the rest of my life? Do I want to live with the fact that we went to the hospital and maybe we didn't need to? Or do I want to live with the fact that we didn't go to the hospital and um, I'm responsible for the death of my daughter because of that. Which is why most people start out in the hospital. They don't right. want to be responsible for the death of their child, and right. they're afraid that if they're not in the hospital, that'll happen. Right. Well, I certainly understand that now. I want my birth to be a magical moment. I want to create that experience for myself, for my baby, for my husband, for us as a family. The other day when we have a baby and, uh, and we're holding him or her in our hands, um, we'll know that, uh, that we did the best that we could based on, on what we discovered throughout our journey. People ask me what inspired me to make the movie. And I have a lot of answers. But it all comes down to one word. Love. I dedicate this film to my mother, who gave birth to me. To her mother, who gave life to her. 
to my wife Mandy, who inspires me, to my daughter Bella, who transformed me, and to all women and children everywhere. come into the world is ultimately what it's all about. Only women get to have it, so I think it's like a blessing. Being pregnant is wonderful. Like, that was the best time of my life, feeling that little growth thing inside of you. Everybody's been doing it for thousands and thousands of years, so I can do it too. I had an epidural, so it wasn't really, I, I still had a lot of back labor, which didn't help, and they don't give you your money back, it doesn't work. <laughs> Maybe I'll go to Holland to have my next one. <laughs> Life, life itself is the best orgasm. It is a life event, of course. Some women, they only experience it once or maybe two, two times in their lifetime. So it's, a, it's a quite an experience. There are really two ways to improve the obstetrics. One is litigation and the other one is education. You don't have to take the epidural at two centimeters and, you know, after taking the birth preparation class. You don't have to do natural childbirth, but you can. You can do any of those things. We need to change things because in another generation or two, we will be a very rare species, those who have given birth with their own body. 
Mother Nature knows it was there long before we were ever there. I think we should take lessons from her and try uh, and stop trying to tell her what to do. What will it take to support the woman to have a peak experience and to welcome the baby with pure love?